Hello and welcome to Human Stories. My name is Darren Byler. I'm an anthropologist at Simon Fraser University. Uh, I do research in Northwest China with a group of people called the Uyghurs, which is a Turkic Muslim group of around 12 million people. Um, they've been in the news a lot recently uh, because many of them have been placed in camps um, and others have been placed in forms of, of forced labor. And often that, that process is described as a human rights crisis or a genocide. And it is those things, or it has, it meets many of those definitions. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is some of the economic drivers behind this system. Um, I'll be kind of describing the way that these camps were built, why they were built, um, and how the forced labor system is connected to them. Um, but underneath all of that, I'll be talking about this as uh, a, a larger sort of global issue, something that's connected to discourses related to terrorism, um, which is something that really, you know, started in the West, started in the United States and Europe, um, and has now become a global phenomenon that is really used to target Muslim people in many locations, um, including China. So I'll be talking about that discourse a bit and also the, the way that the systems that are being in place, putting, being put in place, um, produce forms of economic profit um, in relation to, to data harvesting and also labor. So to understand the story of what's happened to the Uyghurs, we really need to go back to the 1990s, which is when China was opening up to the West, was becoming a manufacturer for the world. And in order to fuel that economy, they needed raw materials. They needed oil, natural gas, um, basic uh, commodities like cotton um, and tomatoes. And to get access to those materials, they needed to fully integrate the Northwest region of the country, which is way up here. Um, and that is uh, also the Uyghurs ancestral homeland. And so in the 1990s, um, the settler populations from other parts of China, um, people that come from a, the majority group, which is called the Han, uh, they arrived and they began to build out the hard infrastructure that's necessary to extract those resources. They built pipelines and roads and railways. Um, and they brought with them a, a service economy. So they, they not only began to extract the resources, uh, oil and natural gas, um, but they also uh, began to take over the institutions that were native to, to Uyghur society, um, which means that they, they took over the education systems, the financial systems. Uh, over time, um, the cost of living began to rise for Uyghurs, who were mostly excluded from those service sectors and, and the natural resource economy. And it pushed them into forms of tenant farming many Uyghurs became cotton farmers working for large industrial farms. Um, others uh, began to look elsewhere for work that was more sustainable, that would provide more for their families. And so lots of young men began to leave the countryside for regional centers and then from there go, go on to Arumchi, which is the capital of the region. This is a city of around 3 million people. Um, and it's where I did my research starting in 2011 uh, all the way up into 2018. Uh, I was there for over 24 months during that period. One of the ways that the migrants organized their life was through uh, smartphone networks, through uh, social media apps, um, such as WeChat, which is a Chinese uh, social media app similar to Twitter or WhatsApp. Um, those you know, Western built apps are banned in China. And so that meant that Uyghurs were sort of forced to use Chinese domestic apps. Um, and they used the oral speech function on that app, used Uyghur language to communicate with each other. And this actually had the effect of, of sort of um, hacking the censorship system in China because the state simply didn't have the ability to track uh, what people were saying in Uyghur language. Um, this was the time of the Arab Spring. It was the time of global piety movements around the world. Um, and so many Uyghurs began to download teachings uh, from Muslim teachers based abroad uh, in places like Turkey and Uzbekistan. They also um, 
you know, or making their own messages um, back in 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 the their homeland. Uh, and of course, they were interested in in you know political news, things like that, and they were receiving that via their smartphones. Many of them, you know, when they got to the city, organized themselves uh, around mosque communities. This became kind of the center of their social life. Um, they said that the mosque space was the space of ritual Islam. It's where you went to pray. Um, but uh, real Islam was happening on their smartphones. It was the space where they could uh, hear speeches, teachings that were unfiltered by the government. Mostly what they were interested in is very normative forms of Islamic practice. What does it mean to be Muslim? What is halal? What is haram? Um, questions that many Muslims ask everywhere in the world. And because they were new to, to digital media, many Uyghurs didn't understand that they were leaving a digital footprint as they, they used their devices. This began to change in, the May, in May of 2014, which is when the state declared the People's War on Terror. Um, this was in response to the sort of glowing, growing piety among Uyghurs. Um, but it was also a response to several violent incidents that were carried out by Uyghurs and, and that which meant sort of international standards for terrorism. Uh, there was an attack at a train station in Kunming, which is a city in eastern, southeast, southwest China, um, and, and in Beijing, the capital of the region. And then there were several incidents in, uh, in Urumqi and, and other spaces in, in the Uyghur region. You know, the people responsible for those incidents were probably several hundred. Um, there may have been a thousand or more that supported them. Um, you know, through forms of material assistance. Uh, but the vast majority of the 12 million Uyghurs really had no connection to the people that carried out that violence. The state, though, used the, the threat of the terrorist um, to begin what they called a de-extremification campaign. Uh, this is something that's connected to what they see, at least, as um, the, the countering violent extremism measures that, that are used in North America and Europe. Um, in, in Britain, it's called prevent. Um, but in this case, you know, it went far beyond simply, you know, keeping tabs on, on who was being radicalized in communities. Instead, it criminalized normative Muslim behavior. And so in the neighborhoods where I was living, I saw these posters being erected everywhere that are saying it's no longer permitted for, for Muslims to veil themselves or have beards if they're under the age of 55 and, and Islamic symbols are not permitted either. You know, around the same time as they declared this people's war on terror, um, the state also implemented some large scale um, surveillance systems or they began to build them out that would begin to automate the, the transcription and translation of Uyghur speech into Chinese. Um, that would also begin to assess Uyghurs based on the, the phenotypes of their face as they move through space using face recognition technology. Um, and they implemented a grid policing system. So throughout the Uyghur neighborhoods where I'd been living, uh, these surveillance hubs were built. Uh, and inside the surveillance hubs are banks of, of, of TV screens where they can watch um, what's happening within the grid that the surveillance hub is responsible for. Um, the state also hired around 90,000 uh, low-level police officers, people called police assistants, to, to watch the cameras, to go on patrols, throughout these grids and to sort the population at checkpoints, which were built at the, at the parameters, the, 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 the limits of the grids. Um, so here is a checkpoint I went through in 2018 where a, a police assistant is sorting the population, opening a back gate as a sort of green lane or express lane for Han people, just based on the appearance of their face. And at the same time, scanning the the IDs and image and faces of Uyghurs as they go through the checkpoint. There's also um, a, a, a data gate that's associated with this uh, checkpoint, which checks the, the person's smartphone to make sure that it's associated with the person carrying the ID. Um, by mid-2017, the state had also distributed these tools throughout the region. These are called counterterrorism swords. They're a kind of device that you can plug into someone's phone or computer, and it will scan through their digital history, looking for over 50,000 markers of political activity or religious activity that have been marked as pre-terrorist or extremist. Um, these devices you know, only take around a minute 
to look through all of that material and then they can uh, rate the person. Uh, they give them three ratings, red, orange, or yellow. The red reading means that the person should be detained immediately. And the, the police contractors who I've interviewed who worked in this space, who did these scans, um, told me that the kinds of readings that they would get were these sorts of things. That this person had gone to the mosque regularly, they had worn a hijab or had pictures of people wearing hijabs, they had contacted people in Muslim-majority countries, um, they had listened to unauthorized religious teachings or been a member of a WeChat group where they studied the Quran. Um, they had used a VPN or had WhatsApp on their phone in the past. Um, they had any material relief related to religious practice. So Islam and Islamic practice itself was criminalized through this system. After someone was detained, if they were given a red uh, reading on the scan, they were often taken to a holding cell where they were interrogated and asked to name others that had taught them about Islam. Um, and then from there, they were often sent to a camp, which were being built uh, simultaneously with the, the rollout of this mass internment system. Um, there's over 300 camps across the region now, and likely as many as one and a half million people uh, were held, at least at the the highest point of, of people in detention camps. It's likely a lower number at this point. Uh, around 2018, we started to see people being transferred from the camps uh, to prison spaces, and in some cases to uh, factories. Oftentimes the factories were, were actually just adjacent to the camp itself. Um, and much of the manufacturing that's going on in these factories is textile manufacturing. Uh, the Uyghur region itself is home to 84% of Chinese cotton, which is you know, close to a quarter or one-fifth of the world's cotton. Uh, so it makes sense that you'd want to source the manufacturing at the location where it's being grown. Um, one of the people that I interviewed who was held uh, in one of these camps for over a year and then was um, placed in one of these factories making gloves was this woman. Her name is Guzira El Khan. She was found guilty of watching Turkish TV shows where people wore hijabs. She had had a passport, had traveled to Kazakhstan, was under the age of 55. These were all enough to, to um, determine that she was untrustworthy and needed re-education. After she was released, she was allowed to return to her village for uh, two or three days. And then the local authority said, now you'll go work in this factory. And it turned out that this factory was actually adjacent to uh, the camp or, or around five kilometers from the camp where she had been held previously. She also recognized her boss in the, the new factory space. Um, this is him speaking in a state TV interview. Uh, his name is Wang Xinghua. Um, and here he's telling uh, the, the TV audience that his company has produced $6 million in sales in 2018 and provided 2,000 jobs to Kazakhs and Uyghurs as part of um, a larger Xinjiang aid project or poverty alleviation project. This is often framed as a, a job creation scheme and the camps themselves are, are framed in that way. What he doesn't say in the interview is that he's only paying Gulzira and the other workers around 300 yuan uh, per month, which is less than a sixth of the minimum wage in the region. Um, and then on top of that, he pays them a penny and a half per pair of gloves. Um, so there's a, 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 a real disparity between the compensation for work and the profits being made. So what can this system tell us uh, about people today? Well, what's happening to the Uyghurs is not simply an isolated human rights crisis. Uh, it is a human rights crisis, but it's also rooted in global political and economic systems. And what I mean by that is it's using the discourse of terrorism to label a Muslim minority group as terrorist or potentially terrorist, and therefore not deserving of the same kinds of civil protections, human rights protections that others enjoy. Instead, uh, they can be treated with impunity because they, they uh, have within them, in their bodies, a kind of implicit threat um, towards others. And so really what this is doing is it's producing a new sequence in racialization, one that's not connected to you know, the history of slavery in the United States, for instance, um, but is, is nevertheless a kind of racialization and a, a form of emphasizing difference in order to exploit it. And this system is something I call terror capitalism. Um, it, it's 
uh, something that's using the rhetoric of terror to make money off of other people. Um, and it, it does two things um, to do this. The first thing that it does is it produces novel forms of digital enclosure, uh, which is using the people's smartphones as tracking devices, using those checkpoints to sort and control movement. Um, it's also through this process, producing new products um, by collecting people's data and new through this, it, predict, it, it builds new prediction tools, which can then be used in artificial intelligence applications in other domains. Um, the other thing that it does is it turns these workers into a subject population of unfree laborers, people that really cannot escape their unfreedom. Um, so it's, it's a kind of forced labor, um, but it, it moves beyond simply the factory space. It's in an, it envelops the entire society. So what the Uyghurs tell me is that, you know, in this space, there's no escaping the camp. When you're in the camp, you're tightly controlled. When you get out of it into the factory, you're still controlled. If you get out of that space, you're also still controlled. There's always checkpoints. So they say it's an open air prison. That's really all I wanna uh, share with you. I just wanted to, to let you know that the system exists and that it's part of a larger, um, a larger discourse and economic system. Many of the things being manufactured in these factories um, are in our supply chain. Uh, the global brands that, that Say that that sell us things that say made in China, especially textiles, um, are often complicit in this system, and so it affects all of us. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you all for your attention. Peace and light to you and yours. So I, I, you know, I sometimes do this and do that.